Thank you. Annelise, over to you. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Ruba, for this very kind introduction. And of course, welcome to everybody. I'm very happy to see that so many people have taken the effort to be present here. It feels a little bit old for me to speak to my own PowerPoint because I only see a few pictures, but I realize that there are many more people there actually. And I would really like to thank Ruba, who is a very dear colleague and friend, as she said already, um, that she has invited me to give this presentation here today. So let me start immediately. Wait a moment. I am stuck here because, the, yes, okay. What is happening? Um, yes, here we go. I was stuck for a moment because of the message of being recorded. Uh, let me start with giving you an outline of my presentation. So how did I get interested in this topic? And I will take you very briefly to Yemen and then I'll take you back to Leiden University. Then I'll give this brief chronology from 2003 to 2019. And 2019 is the year in which we have this partial prohibition of face coverings turned into a law. I will, I, I will explain to you uh, how face fails have become a problem in the Netherlands and to whom they have become a problem. I will, I will present to you the arguments against face fading. I will present to you also the perspectives of the Nikabi women themselves. Then I will say a few words about how the ban actually took hold and what happened in its aftermath, which involves a lot of Nikabi activism actually. And finally, I will have a brief reflection on face veils and face masks, because I think that is a way of what I would formulate as unmasking selective Dutch liberalism. So let me start immediately and go with you to Yemen briefly. In 2002, I was, I was invited to teach a course on qualitative methodology at Sana'a University in Yemen. Now, this was the first time I went to Yemen. It was also the first time I was teaching in Arabic. So I was already, you know, sort of anxious about this whole enterprise. But then I discovered that more than half of the students in my class were actually wearing a face veil. So I got more concerned because I was concerned, would I be able to understand them? Would I be able to communicate with the women? And would I be able to distinguish between them? So it took me a few days. And within a few days, I realized that these anxieties were largely unfounded because if you have the intention to communicate, which my students had, then you can actually communicate quite easily. And also I realized very quickly that my students were not only wearing a face veil, but they were also had different styles of appearing. They were, some of them were tall, some of them were short, some of them had, they had different kinds of voices and they especially had different kinds of presence in the classroom, that is, some of them were very present. They would ask questions all the time. They were definitely there. Whereas other students were much more withdrawn. They would, you know, not ask very much. They would sit in the back of the classroom. In other words, they're actually very similar. The spread was very similar to what I was used to in the classroom in the Netherlands. I did also a small research project on wearing the tab in Yemen. So, and I know the talk is not about that, but I want to just just I, uh, hi, um, highlight a few points because they are very interesting because of the differences. One of them is that in Sana'a, wearing a face veil is a majority practice. So most of the women at the time when I did research were covering their face. That means that also it is the, ma the majority practice. So it also means that there may be some level of social pressure to actually wear a face veil. I quickly learned also that whether you wear one or not is very strongly context dependent. Some women, for instance, the women who were teaching at university would not wear it at the university itself, but they would change and wear a very different kind of outfit, including a face veil, when they would go to the market because in the market, they would feel much more comfortable wearing a face veil because they were anonymous. So it was much easier for them to actually bargain with the traders in the market. Also, for instance, when wearing makeup, they would completely cover. So they were all different. It was context dependent whether they would cover their face or not. 
then of course the topic always came of whether this was now an Islamic practice or not. And here the main point was that everybody agreed that there are difference of, differences of opinion about it. So it's not an obligatory practice for everybody. You have to use your own conscience. And there was actually an interesting section of younger, usually younger women who decided to wear hijab Islami. Now, if you say in the Netherlands, I'm going to wear hijab, it usually means that you start covering yourself more. If you say this in Sana'a, you're going to wear hijab Islami, it meant to uncover it because you show your hands and your face. So it's a very different kind of dynamics at stake there. Okay, after my trip to Sana'a, I came back to Leiden University and lo and behold, at Leiden University, I discovered there was a great uproar because there were two students who were covering their face in the university. Um, I found this an interesting, it was, the interesting thing was, was in particular the, to the kind of debate that this gave rise to. So I actually started then a research project and I wrote a report about this, which was published in 2009 and which was actually, interestingly enough, subsidized by the Dutch government. So let me start now the short chronology about um, face failing in the Netherlands. In 2003, there was a school for adult education in Amsterdam. Two or three girls from Moroccan Dutch background decided to start wearing a face veil. The teacher didn't like it. The school wanted to prohibit it. The girls protested. They went to the Equal Treatment Commission and the Equal Treatment Commission says the school is right. They can have this local prohibition of face coverings. Now, the interesting thing is that this is a major shift compared to the year 2000. In the year 2000, there was a very similar case in another city. But in that case, the Equal Treatment Commission decided that it was no, there were no leg legitimate reasons for a ban. But the most interesting thing actually was there was no media attention at all in 2000. Nobody was paying any attention to this particular case. And I looked through all the newspapers and said, yeah, no attention was paid to it. In 2000, see, it was huge, a huge uproar. And the context is that there was from between 2000 and 2002, you have this watershed in Dutch politics. You have this extremely sharp turn to ethno-nationalism and right-wing populism. There's really, it's, it's hard to overstate that particular shift in, Dutch, in the Dutch political climate. There are a few things that are important to note here. First of all, that I use in the uh, above the term face coverings. And that is because they did not use the term face veils or, or burqas or niqabs, etc. Because if they had used the term that is directly linked to a religion, then this would constitute direct discrimination of religion, which is unconstitutional in the Netherlands. Now, if you use the term face coverings, it would also include non-religious kinds of face coverings, like a motor helmet or a bakalawa, then the argument of direct discrimination does no longer work. However, then the argument comes in that this may be indirect discrimination of religion, but in the case of indirect discrimination, because it targets disproportionately a particular group of people, in that particular case, you can have val a valid legitimation to do so. And then the legitimation was security, either no need of identification and the need for communication in this school. So that is why it was actually, it turned out to be legitimate. So the thing to notice here is then also that this was a local prohibition. It was just a prohibition at this particular school. And once the Equal Treatment Commission had indeed pronounced that it was okay to have this ban, ban at this particular school, the whole uproar quieted down and nobody was asking for a general ban or anything similar to that. However, in 2005, suddenly the Dutch parliament votes in favor of a complete ban that is in all public space. So not a ban we have now, the partial ban, but a complete ban. This was actually the first parliament that voted in favor of such a complete ban. So it was before France. Usually we think that France and Belgium were the first countries where this ban was being discussed. In the Netherlands, it was actually discussed beforehand. It was already voted in favor of in parliament. However, this 
this, the resolution was proposed by Geert Wilders. Geert Wilders is, of course, our very well-known anti-Islam uh, politician. Uh, and Wilders made the argument that he wanted a complete ban of the burqa in all public space because the burqa is a symbol of women's oppression, it hinders identification, it hinders integration, it produces a parallel society, and so forth and so on. But the way in which he formulated it, you see that immediately, is that he uses the term burqa. So it was already immediately clear that it would be unconstitutional. Okay, so there's a lot of discussion going on, but then it's clear that this resolution cannot be, cannot be turned into a law. Then in 2008, we get a proposal for a partial ban of face coverings. Face coverings, so this becomes a constitutionally possible. And then you see between 2008, I'm not gonna bore you with all everything that happened in between, because between 2008 and 2019, you see a continuously shift depending upon the kind of the coalition government we have between attempts to have a complete ban or to have a partial ban. If we had a center right wing government, they wanted a complete ban. If we had a center left wing government, they wanted a partial ban. In the end, in 2019, we have then this partial ban of face coverings becoming law. Now I would immediately put a big question mark at this whole term partial ban because it actually bans your presence if you cover your face in all educational institutions, in all health centers, in all public transportation, and in all government buildings, which means it is de facto impossible for you if you wear a face veil to get access to any type of government service. So that is why I somewhat ironically wrote down here the Nirkabi as consumer, because the only thing you basically can do then is you can go on the street and you can go to the store. Now the question is then, how did this face fail become such a national issue? Um, again, we have to go back to Geert Wilders, and he's, he starts raising this issue during a debate on security. Hey, on, radical, on radical Islam, security, etc. And he points them to the fact that in Belgium there is already a local ban in one particular city, and that we should also have a ban, but then a national ban in the Netherlands. How it, at the very same time, because he gives then a, an interview, a very long interview in one of the populist newspapers, and in that article itself is recognized that there is not yet a problem in the Netherlands with face-failing women. The problem that was there in 2003 had been solved. There were no other issues at all with respect to face-failing. So there is a very strong recognition there is no problem. But Wilder says, well, I will turn it into a problem. And actually, you have other politicians who follow suit, such as one of the Christian Democrats. He also is interviewed at a certain moment, and the interviewer says to him, but do you realize that you know, using the term burqa, et cetera, this will be unconstitutional. And of course the guy, he says, yeah, yes, I do realize this, but the value is, the value is not necessarily that we get this law actually on the books. The value is that we raise this as a problem. So we turn this into a problem that needs to be debated in public debate. So it's a very active attempt to politicize wearing a face veil. You can also see this when you look at the media coverage for the, in the first decade of this century, because except for the year 2003, yeah, what I already told you about the school in Amsterdam, it was, there was always media attention because it was raised, the issue was raised by politicians or people in parliament. And they raised it as an issue and then you get the attention in the media. You also see something very interesting with respect to the universities. I already mentioned Leiden University, but Leiden University did the same thing as the school. They also did a local prohibition, which is possible because they use the same kind of formulation. And then you get these other universities that are following suit. So that's the, the picture you see there on the bottom is from a university paper of the Free University. And you see all this press attention and this guy speaking. Well, this was a debate about the ban on face coverings at the free university. So, of course, one raises then, or I mean, the question then comes up from how many students are there actually? And every single time, except for Leiden, every single time the answer was 
none. There is no student yet wearing a face veil, but you never know. They may appear and then we are ready for it. And we don't have to think about this again. That was the argument. So what kind of problem, how do people see this as a problem? Well, they see point of, that the points that are time and again raised are women's oppression, security, communication, participation. There we go. Let's go first to women's oppression. Now, how many, let's first have a little bit of an image about what, what, who are the people we are talking about. There are about 100 to 500 women, and I stretch it wide because I include both the women who wear it fairly consistently and the ones who wear it only part-time. Part-time, it means that they wear it at some occasions, but not at other occasions. Some would not wear it, for instance, if they go and visit their family. Some would only wear it when they go to a mosque. So people have different, uh, have different ways of going about it. So say 100 to 500 about, but even if it's a thousand, you know, the population of the Netherlands is 17 million. So it means that, you know, you have a chance of about one in 300,000 on average that you would meet somebody wearing a face veil. Now, of course, I also realize that in certain neighborhoods, it is more common than in other neighborhoods, but nonetheless, it's a minute number of people. Now, these women are not recent refugees. They're not recent migrants. They're mainly converts and women of Moroccan Dutch background who have been raised in the Netherlands. So they're basically Dutch Muslims. But it's not a force coming from outside. It's really, there are Dutch Muslims. As it turns out, their families and their husbands are often against it. So it's not so much pressure from the families, what was in the beginning often assumed, pressure from their families or pressure from their husbands that they need to cover. They're more often against it. They don't like it. They try to, to prohibit it. They try to discourage it. Many of the women express that they do this because of religious reasons. And I say many of the women because, of course, we can never have a complete image. We can never say on academic grounds that, you know, it's everybody. Because there can always be somebody who is forced by her family or somebody who is in a very difficult situation. But because I've talked to so many of them, I can say that many women actually do this because they consider it a highly desirable religious practice. And they do so, and they have different formulations. And I thought it was interesting to present you some of the terms they use themselves. They call it an act of worship, a means of getting closer to God, a way of expressing their love for God a way of being more in love again with Islam, of doing something extra. They call it, they feel as if they're floating in the air. They feel being at peace with themselves. So these are just some of the terms that the women themselves use. And so you can see already that it is a quite a strong, effective language. Then covering the face is also a disciplinary sartorial practice, very similar to what Sabah Mahmoud has actually discussed in her books, The Politics of Piety, when she writes about the mosque movement in Egypt, where you wear a particular style of dress, not simply to express your interior feelings, but also to produce a more modest self and to produce a more desexualized society. And they also use aesthetic terms once in a while. They call it also beautiful. They call it har a harmonious way of looking, a simple way. Com they call it complete. So they use these kind of terms to describe their style of dress. And I highlight that because if you listen to our politicians who also regularly feel the need to express their feelings about you know, how they experience this style of dress, they would usually phrase it, they find it ugly, they find it disgusting. They, so they use all these very strong, effective notions, but very negative kind of notions. Which, of course, is also in some ways understandable, because if you see something as the embodiment of women's oppression, then it also comes with a certain effective, you, you get a certain, uh, it has a certain effect then if you, if you are looking at this particular person. The last point here is that, especially in the earlier years, the term burka was used all the time in the Netherlands. It's only more recently that people turn to the term nikah, which is the term the women themselves use. And the term burka in itself had this sort of performative power because 
this was at the time of the war in Afghanistan and the term burqa was known amongst the wider Dutch public as synonym with the Taliban and women's oppression under the Taliban. So the use of this term burqa in itself had a particular, a particular strong uh, affective uh, effect as it were. Now, if you look at the ways what people actually wear in the Netherlands when they cover their face, it's much more like a Khalid a, a style as women in Egypt would wear or in the Gulf would wear. It's not the kind of burqa that women in uh, Afghanistan wear, which has the little mesh in front of the eyes, etc. Now, the other arguments were security and participation. Security, yeah, unfortunately for the government, the security didn't really work very well because the security services, the police, public transportation, all were not in favor of the ban because they didn't recognize it as a problem. They didn't recognize face veils as a problem. And I mean, the chances that you actually have somebody in public transport who wears a face veil are very small. And usually the person doesn't, you know, do anything else except being present. So public transportation has much more serious problems with violent young men rather than with the ones in a, with, this, with the very few face failing women that they are confronted with. And moreover, public transportation sector itself said, well, we already have the means to act if we need to because we can impose house rules. So in a very similar way as the school had done in Amsterdam, also public transportation could actually make house rules that you cannot enter public transportation if you cover your face. The painful thing about the whole thing is, however, is that in these discussions about security, the women are seen as a security threat, but there is very, very little concern about the ways in which women are, these women themselves are at risk of verbal or physical violence that is virtually completely neglected. And what became already clear in the research that I did was that there was a strong link between being at risk of verbal and physical violence and the moments at which the niqab became really a topic of public debate, of political debate. So at the moment when politicians felt free to make all sorts of derogatory statements about covering the face, then people in the street also felt more legitimate, felt more legitimized to actually do the same. So the women were actually more, at the, in those moments, were more at risk than they would have been otherwise. The other argument is participation. And when the government talks about participation, they usually have some idealized notion about women's participation in formal employment. And the measuring, the measuring rod seems to be, you know, the sort of professional middle-class women, secular, et cetera, who have a career. Now, many women in the Netherlands do not live up to that ideal. Also, our Nikaris do generally not live up to that ideal. So it all depends where you compare them with, because we have then what becomes what many women who wear niqab would say is important to them, that is religion and taking care of their raising their children well, taking care of their family, raising their children well. Although more recently also work has become a more important uh, topic. But if you compare that, for instance, with the strict Protestants, where we also have a considerable number of in the Netherlands, then you see that these ways of, these this kind of ideals are actually quite similar. What you also see, of course, is that this ban, which bans them from education, et cetera, actually excludes them from participating in society. And actually also punishes them because they are if, if they are seen as the victim because they are oppressed, then it becomes even more complex to understand how the government can actually make this into a logical train of thought. Now I want to go do a little sideline here and turn to to, uh, to public popular culture because it's hard to imagine, I mean, it's not hard to imagine, but I mean, I would like to highlight how immensely uh, present this particular topic was between 2005 and 2008. It was really very strong, 2007 perhaps. It was really very 
very present. So you also had these cartoonists who made cartoons about women, you know, the burka babes here, because what the burka babes is actually that. I will show you also here. It's a booklet like this, and it has all little uh, cartoons in there, and it comes in a bag. Burka. Very shiny bag. Uh, but originally, these cartoons were published in an upscale daily. So every so many days, there would be a cartoon about the Burka babes. So this, they became tremendously popular and they were turned into this booklet first they were in Dutch and then it was translated in English. So I'll show you a few of them. And I show you two because I think they are so strongly because they really illustrate the sort of narrative I just have just presented. Looking forward to spring. Now I'll have to ask my husband. And the other one, you know, where the radicalization comes in. Oh, I get it. The, the, the boys go all fundamentalist and you're left with the donkey work. Huh? So you see, actually, it is, I think it's a very strong illustration of, you know, the sort of, the, the, the ways in which the niqab has been constructed in Dutch public debate. We also have a very different genre, a little bit uh, a more, a more um, if, you, if you want to say, more optimistic genre. That is Aziz Bakawi, who is an artist and a fashion designer. And he turned the burqa actually in visual art and creatively played with it in fashion advertising uh, billboards. So he had this exhibit of these glossy billboards with these elegant, powerful, uh, playful women, which I will show in a second. And in combination with slight adaptations of famous advertising slogans. And his argument was that this was a way of normalizing the presence of the burqa. So here we go. This was Aziz's, I just downloaded from it from the website. So this is the sort of uh, thing, you know, playing on the L'Oreal uh, slogan. And this is the one playing on McDonald's. He has a whole series of them, but I just thought two would be sufficient to show to you. So you see how this whole public discourse also then moves into all kinds of forms of popular culture, art, etc. There are very unpleasant ones also, which I'm not going to show because they're too unpleasant. Not from Aziz, of course. But I thought these, these two give you sort of a, a, a the kind of, of, of image what is uh, what was available in those days. So let's get back to something more serious now. That is the cabinet analysis of face coverings. Because if you look at, uh, I, I, I fished up a document from 2008. And it's really interesting how they actually discuss this issue or the problem with face coverings. So here the cabinet is, uh, the, the document is speaking. They evidently, face coverings, evidently hinder open communication. They are considered as women unfriendly. And to many, they are a symbol of fundamentalist Islam that does not suit Dutch society. This style of dress evokes in many a feeling of anxiety and unsafety. And the cabinet considers open communication between citizens, participation and equal chances for men and women, essential values of Dutch society and our democratic rule of law. So you see how in this one document, you move very quickly from a face fail hindering open communication to a face fail actually being an obstacle to the democratic rule of law. Seems to be quite a step to be taken here. So let's look a little closer at that. Um, now let's first remember that the prohibition also in, 200, in 2008 that was being discussed was a prohibition for particular locations. The arguments on the previous sheets were basically arguments that were relating to the street, how we appear in the street. So that brings up questions. I'll just raise the questions, you know, do we need to always communicate in the street? Isn't, aren't there similar problems when people are on their cell phones all the time? Communicating on the street is often very gendered and can also be very unpleasant. Huh? So this whole idea of, you know, celebrating communication, I find somewhat problematic there. Then if we go from, away from the street to these particular interactions in the health sector, in education, etc., there, 
it is a different story. There what matters, and that is what the women themselves would also say, it matters whether you make an effort. And this effort has to be made both by the women themselves, as they would say, and their interlocutors. So you have to be willing to actually talk to each other, right? So I'll give you an example. One, one of the women said, well, when I go to the doctor's office, well, first of all, usually when they go to the doctor, when they're in the office with the doctor, they will simply take off their face veil. But she says, when I'm waiting in the waiting room of the doctor's office, then I always make sure that I speak loud and clearly in Dutch with my children. So the people know that I'm just Dutch and I speak Dutch at Fitfrat. And I'll also make sure that my hands are always visible so people do not worry about what is she doing underneath all these all this clothing. So people already have this sort of and make an attempt to accommodate in certain ways. They realize that people look at them in a certain way and they try to accommodate. Or they would criticize others who do not do so. The other point is, is discomfort actually an argument for a prohibition? Yeah, because if this would be, if discomfort, if you feel discomfort when you see somebody in the street dressed in a particular way, would that be also then valid for other ways of appearing in the public? Would it be simply, you know, the sort of thing the majority rules here? And is seeing facial expressions actually needed for living together? And there is, and behind this is actually a whole theory about what facial expressions do. So do you, with your facial expressions, do you actually show your feelings or are you sometimes also hiding these? And we have also many sayings that you have to be careful and never trust something on face value, for instance. And there are many ways in which you have to be also very careful in how a person appears in the public. And does it not also matter what sort of feelings the person is expressing? Is it always desirable to be confronted with, is it always desirable that somebody actually expresses his inner feelings in their facial expressions to be, you know, to be in open communication? In some cases, it may be more desirable if people do not show all their feelings in the public. It's a bit similar, a bit, I say, to the discussions about freedom of speech. Oh, are you, of course, you're allowed to say all sorts of stuff, but whether it is desirable to actually do so to live together in a somewhat pleasant way, that is a different question. So what I actually think is going on here is that this discomfort which we are discussing is actually the effect of a certain kind of dissonance. And the dissonance is the following. On the one hand, the women are seen as oppressed because of Islam. And this comes back time and again. This also in 2019, you will still hear the same argument in parliament. The women are, these women are oppressed. We have to do something about that. So these women are oppressed and yet they appear hyper visible in the public as actually they have a strong presence. You know, they're not hiding. They have a strong presence in the public. So you can compare the, I also always like to play a little bit with this idea of the visor effect. The women are able to see, but they are not, their face is not completely seen. So that, in a sense, clashes with the conventional notion that those in power remain invisible, they are entitled to remain invisible, whereas those in subaltern positions are often the object of scrutiny. So I think that the discomfort comes, comes forth, it, it emerges much more by the fact that these women have a strong presence. Not that they are oppressed, but they are, they are actually strong characters. And um, that, that is the effect. I mean, that is, that is one of the reasons why this discomfort is so often referred to. So what, where are we now? We have just, there is no clear problem with these very, this very small number of women appearing in the public. And it's not simply the small number, because of course, you know, the number of murders in the country is also small, but it also depends what a person does. Now, they do not cause any particular kinds of problems. And if there are problems, they can be solved through house rules. So we are faced with a form of symbolic politics. But we also have seen already that these symbolic politics are not innocent, but have effects. They, have, they cause problems for the women themselves. And I will give you one other example why, what is the problem with this symbolic politics? And that is that it leads to a huge overestimation of the number of women actually in the Netherlands, which in itself produces fear and discomfort. I'm showing you here 
uh, the estimate, there was a poll in, two, again, in 2008, there was a poll in the Netherlands about how people felt about uh, people, uh, women covering their face, which is not so interesting. But the most interesting thing is the last question. The last question was, how many women do you think wear a face veil in the Netherlands? The actual number is between 100 and 500, right? 17% thought it was more than 20,000. 31% thought it was more than 10,000. So this, this discrepancy is huge. So it is not surprising that people feel uncomfortable if they have gotten the idea that there are so many women wearing a face veil in the Netherlands, which seems to be the effect of all this media attention, all this attention in politics. At a certain moment, we had five ministers in a, in a parliamentar parliamentary meeting talking for five hours about these 100 to 500 women. So, I mean, it does create a, a particular kind of atmosphere, which gives people apparently the impression that they're far more than they actually are. Now, how have people responded, actually? What kind of niqab activism is there? In 2009, there was nothing. We tried to, with a group of people, we tried to, uh, <clears throat> to see whether they were interested in writing a petition or a letter to protest against this law, but there was, there was people were, the niqabis were so concerned about appearing in the public that they did not really want to take part in this kind of a, of, of, um, of a debate. This changed by the time it was 2015 about. I'm not quite exact about the year, but it's around that time when it became clear that this uh, this, this law would actually materialize because laws in the Netherlands as elsewhere have to go through all sorts of cycles. They have to go first to the lower lower chamber, then to the Senate, and then they have to, add, they have, to have the advice of the Council of State. Now, the Council of State has always been hugely critical and has remained until today very critical about this law because they consider it problematic because there is no problem and because the solution is disproportional. For the, the, the of, of having a ban. So the Council of State has remained very critical, but nobody had actually uh, estimated, no, nobody had thought that the parliament would totally negate the advice of the Council of State, which is what happened. So once that once it became clear that the Council of State would be critical, but that parliament would actually not follow the advice of the Council of State, then the women started organizing and there was a group of about at the beginning about eight women that started the group do not touch my kneecap and that is the picture you see it's a facebook group and it says in dutch my choice and they wrote a letter to parliament protesting against it and having making all the arguments that i have made also previously so they made all these arguments and they were hugely disappointed because they got very, very little support by Muslim organizations. Basically, all the Muslim representatives who function as representatives of Muslim communities to the Dutch state actually supported the state in the ban. So they were hugely disappointed. So the letter to parliament was only signed and supported by, by a small number of Salafi-oriented mosques and organizations some more general women organizations and a few academics, but that was basically it. So it was quite a disappointment. At the same time in 2015, also another group emerged, which is called Report Islamophobia. This was a, a small group of Muslim women who became increasingly concerned with the fact that Islamophobic incidents were nowhere as recorded. It was impossible to know how many of these incidents were taking place. And what was the background of these incidents. I will get back to that in a second because this group is also important. So we get now the ban in, uh, on 1 August 2019. And what you see then is a very quick emergence of activism. And one of the reasons why you get this enormous, this, this upsurge of activism is because one of our newspapers decides to run on the very same day to run a long article about how to do a citizen's arrest. A citizen's arrest means that, as the newspaper explained, if you see somebody in a burqa where she is not allowed to be and you feel uncomfortable, you are allowed to do a citizen arrest, to arrest the person and to hold her. 
until the police shows up. Um, this, of course, circulated very quickly in right-wing circles, etc. And this finally woke up a lot of people who would previously not have cared very much about this topic. And then you get a group like the Burka Bodies. The Burka Bodies is a group support, support for, as it says in Dutch, there below. It's again, it's Facebook, it's, it's uh, Facebook based. And it's a group for support and protection of women wearing niqab who want to go in the public, who are concerned about going into the public sphere, and they offer to accompany them when they want to go somewhere. And that is the idea. And you can become a member of the Facebook group, Burka Buddies, and it very quickly mushroomed, and they have all regional, you know, regional smaller organizations and, and et cetera. It was really started by niqabis, by niqabis and other Muslim women, themselves and then also included non-Muslims. So that was usually successful. Then the women, the niqabs themselves, decided that they were going to have, I call it their demonstration, they would call it a silent protest probably. And what happened is um, that they decided to have to do something. We are already also realized that they were too late, of course, eh, because the law was already implemented. But they decided nonetheless to have this silent protest to at least do something. And there was this quite large, I've never seen actually so many, I think nobody has seen so many. Uh, uh, Makrama, you're next. Yes. Okay. Nobody, yeah. I don't think yeah. anyone has seen so many. And you've got two slides. And then Linda, you're going to finish off with that. Okay. Should I, should I stop or? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Someone has forgotten to unmute. Oh, okay. No problem. Okay, so I'll continue. So there was this, they, they organized this demonstration. It was a huge, well, a huge demonstration is maybe a big word. It was about 100, 150 people. But taking into consideration how small the number of women wearing a niqab in the Netherlands is, that is quite a considerable number because a substantial number of them were niqab wearers. But there were also other, other, people from our different backgrounds there because one of the most interesting things was it was actually organized by a group called Hand in Hand Against the Niqab Ban, which was a group of niqab wearing women. But they had managed to uh, to have links with all sorts of different groups. So there were anti-racist groups, there were people from anti-racist groups there, from the LBTG community were there, etc. So it was really a very broad coalition of people coming together at this silent protest, but it was really organized by the women themselves. Um, and so it was clearly a demonstration against the ban. It was not a position on wearing niqab, whether that's a good thing to do or not. It was against the ban. And one of the things that I found striking again here is that actually in parliament, there were complaints that well, the, the, the argument in Parliament was, we have this law now, so people should submit to the law and not demonstrate against it. Which is, of course, a very strange argument because it happens all the time. Yeah, it's one of our, it's our civil right, actually, to, um, to, um, to, uh, to, to have demonstrations. So, and they had simply followed all the rules. They had contacted, contacted the municipality. They have followed all the rules and regulations. But nonetheless, there was this sort of very strong apprehension that these women now actually would speak, would again speak out against this law. So you have a picture there. We are, we are victims of symbol, symbolic politics. And this gives you an impression of the, uh, of the demonstration. So one of the things that was also very interesting and which I became aware of because I was present at one of them is that this that one of the women Karima Rahmani who is the spokesperson for keep off don't touch my uh, don't touch my niqab uh, and she became a very vocal spokesperson and this became tremendously unsettling to people who were arguing that these women were terribly oppressed because in below is a is a screenshot from a from a meeting that was two months after the the prohibition was uh, had materialized, because then you have somebody there sitting arguing 
you know, they have, no, all these women are oppressed and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's horrible. And it's also, it's not simply that they are oppressed, but it's also a symbol of oppression, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's actually somebody sitting next to her wearing a niqab who then answers and says, yes, but I don't feel oppressed, da, 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 and has this whole story. And then the other person says, yes, well, maybe you don't feel oppressed. No, I believe you that you are not oppressed. But so many women in, in uh, Iran or in Afghanistan are oppressed, which is, of course, a, you know, a completely different situation, which then Karima says, of course, this is a very different situation, but we're talking about the Netherlands now. And I'm not oppressed. And by the way, for me, it's not a symbol at all, a symbol of oppression. For me, it's a symbol of religiosity, etc. Huh? So, I mean, and this, I think, is something that has worked strongest. You know, the fact that actually the Nikavis are themselves taking part in the discussion now. Then the group I mentioned previously, Report Islamophobia, has produced a black paper about the uh, the burqa ban and they call it a plea for abolishing the uh, burqa ban and some of their conclusions are first of all that there has been a sharp increase in the verbal and physical attacks which does not come as a surprise um because it fits very much with my pre with the previous research on you know the moment politicians raise this issue then the street follows as it were the striking thing was, however, that also women who are wearing kneecap where this is not prohibited were attacked and were verbally abused. So it was usually, it was usually not in schools, it was usually not in medical uh, centers, etc. But it was just blatant, just simply on the streets, or they were refused entry into a playground because the person who was in charge of the playground thought this was prohibited, which it wasn't. So you get, so this spreads, you know, this slips into all sorts of, this ban spreads to all sorts of directions because also women who were only wearing hijab then were, were attacked and they, they, they were told that, well, this will be also be prohibited very soon and you shouldn't be wearing this, et cetera, et cetera. So this whole atmosphere, the whole, it's got almost like a life of its own. So that is the women themselves. But I think there's also a more general polarization that is the effect of this. And that is because it's up to, as I said, it is up to the sectors to implement the ban. So, you know, the, 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 the security guards, the bus drivers, et cetera, they have some discretion, discretion there. They, do not, they, are, they are not punishable by law if they do not enforce the ban. So they can actually, you know, sort of chose and see what to do. At the same time, the mayors of the big cities and the police had said, well, this is not a priority issue for us. So if somebody rings us off, you know, we have here somebody who is a kneecap. We usually have a lot of other stuff that has higher priority. So that means that then these security guards, bus drivers, et cetera, they actually have to decide what to do. And uh, they may themselves have different opinions but also the public around them may have different opinions. So they may also feel either being pushed to act in one way or another because they are pressured by the public around them. So you can understand that this gives rise to a lot of tension and unpleasant situations. So a few weeks ago, the conclusion was one year after the Burka then that no, no fines, there had been no fines at all for the women concerned and only four warnings. But I think this very much underestimates the negative effects of the law on people. You know, you do not need to have fines and uh, a large number of warnings to still have a negative effect. There are, of course, also the positive effects that people who got moving, right? They got into action. There was also a very moving example of a woman in the south of the country who lives in a small place and had to travel by bus. And this became an increasingly problematic thing because it was a bus driver who did really not want her on his bus, et cetera. So then there was actually a collection, a money collection for her to be able to actually get her driver's license. So she would be able to go to work by car. So these things also happen at the same time. Huh? Now we get to the last thing, the face masks, a reflection on the face masks. Um, from 1 July 2020 on, because of COVID, in the Netherlands, you are obliged to wear a face mask if you go on public transportation. 
The question is, of course, we had at the same time, we have a law that states that we are not allowed to cover our faces when we go into public transportation. Now, there is a legal exception to this law, and the legal exception is that if you need to cover your face for health reasons, you actually can do so. So that was the sort of the loophole that they used for this. But then the problematic issue became that the outbreak management team, which is a Dutch, um, uh, a Dutch a committee that advises the government on COVID-related issues at the highest level, so they're very influential, they have actually stated time and again that there's no evidence that wearing a non-medical face mask actually protects you. So you get this very, and this is quite an extraordinary position. I won't go into that now, but the Netherlands has a quite, ex, quite exceptional position with, re with respect to face masks. But anyway, so they think, the highest medical authority thinks it has no health effects, yet it's used as a legal exception to allow face masks on public transportation. The question then becomes, of course, is wearing a knee cap now also permissible because it also covers your nose and your mouth. And is wearing a kneecap sufficient to fulfill these obligations to actually wear a face mask in public transportation? So this leads to all sorts of poster making, etc. So this is made by a Nikabi woman herself, who this is of course a uh, uh, this is a uh, a waiting waiting space to board public transportation. So one is allowed, the other one is not. And this is actually one of the most interesting things because by now the, the, the government has made a statement that you actually are allowed to go on public transportation wearing a face veil, that you can do so. It's still not clear whether it's sufficient, but you are allowed to wear a face veil. That does not mean that there are no problems, but I mean, you are allowed to do this. This is the official point of view. So, but that's on public transportation because on public transportation, it is at the moment obligatory to cover your face. Now, this is the door of a uh, mother and child center. In a mother and child center, you, you, it, it is advisable, but it's not obligatory to cover your face. So you have two posters. One is, please wear a face mask, and the top one to protect everybody. The lower one, on the same door, is prohibited to wear face covering. And I'll show you the lower one in more detail. The lower one is, it has the whole narrative, First one is uh, the locations where you are prohibited from covering your face. Then it's second one is the kind of face coverings that are prohibited. The third one is that why is this the case? Because we have to communicate with each other, which you cannot do when you cover your face. And the fourth is about the fine that you will get if you cover your face. So, um, what I've said is that actually you are now allowed to go into public transportation wearing a face uh, and a face veil in the tab. But still we have face, we, the, the same problems are still occurring that in some settings that women are refused because they wear a face veil. So then they, they know by now that they actually are entitled to do so. So they have to make an, an argument with the bus driver and they have to tell him, you know, you have to call your superiors because I know I'm allowed to be on the bus. So, there, there are still, all these things are still going on. Sometimes even people who, even women who wear a, a face mask and hijab, you know, and, and uh, cover their hair, get comments or are refused because it looks as if they're wearing a face veil. So there was actually a case of a, of a woman who got into a discussion uh, with, um, I think it was, I don't know whether it was a bus driver or a security guard, so, no, it was a security guard, this is a female security guard. And so the security guard said, well, you're not allowed in here because you are wearing a face, a, a face cover. And then she said, well, I'm wearing a, a mouth, a mouth uh, mask, you know, a face mask, I'm allowed to do this. Why, what, what's the problem? And then the woman actually said to her, well, yes, but in the case of other people, I can see their hair. And in your case, I can't see your hair. And there is of course no obligation in the Netherlands to uncover your hair, right? I mean, so this becomes, it becomes a very convoluted kind of argumentation, all of which makes it, of course, very obvious that it's not about covering the face, but it's covered. It's about the position of Muslims in our society. So the last thing about the face masks now is 
what will the effects of these face masks be about, you know, on the on on the ban? Now, Parliament actually voted. Somebody brought it into Parliament, and Parliament voted against a temporary lifting the ban. I'll show that in a second. And I think what matters very much is again that also not only in the case of the face veil interpretations matter, but also in the case of face masks interpretations matter. So there are people who value wearing face masks positively as a sign of caring for others, etc., who will have a much more positive view about you know, this whole issue about face masks than the people who consider this as a mandatory top-down imposition that limits your freedom, etc., etc., which would produce a different set of feelings. It would consider to produce anger, resentment, etc. So if you want to think about what the effect may be of this whole issue of face masks now about face fails. And if you want to go beyond the legal thing, eh, what I've done till now, then I think the first thing that you would need to do is take into consideration what is the meaning actually of wearing face masks to people. This is the vote in Parliament, by the way, whether there would be a temp temporary lifting of the uh, of the ban on face coverings, and you can see that only two political parties were in favor of lifting it. Now, my final point is that um, actually, what we are seeing is, of course, that we have here a politicization of the niqab, that we see a form of symbolical politics that, nonetheless, is not innocent but actually produces problems, both problems for the women, but I think also wider societal problems. The problem with face coverings is very clearly because it involves a category of people who have been turned into undesirable Muslim women. The context of this whole thing is the turn to ethno-nationalism and to right-wing populism, which produces a notion of the nation which is strongly homogenizing and which actually goes into the direction of, I think, an extreme form of majoritarianism. You can also see that it's not a divide between Muslims and non-Muslims. I already said, you know, some of these Muslim representatives actually supported the government. So you can actually see that sometimes good Muslims are easily included in this homogen homogenizing nation or uh, national belonging. Although it's never very, it's always an unstable situation. But what you, what the bottom line is, of course, that you see the scapegoating of a very small group of women. At the same time, what you see is the emergence of a new generation of very self-confident Muslims who demand their civil rights, including their right to wear niqabs. So it includes also niqabis themselves, and there is no who actually, you can read this very easily as, you know, there is no space anymore for white paternalism. And you can see that both in the case of the niqab and in the case of the face mask, that interpretation matters. So I, this is, you know, so the whole, the, the, the well, I, I guess the clearest is this, this what you see here. Actually, we have had, had so many issues now that, that really target Muslims in a very unpleasant way recently that one of the parliamentarians actually, actually tabled a resolution and the resolution was very basic. The resolution was, can we say, can we actually make a statement that the Islam is part of the Netherlands and that Muslims are equal citizens? And there were still, well, two of these crosses, these red crosses are individuals, but there are still three political parties that voted against that. So you can look, of course, very optimistically at this and say, well, the majority, say 85% uh, of parliamentarians voted for this, agreed with it. But nonetheless, I think it's also very concerning that 15% of our representatives in parliament actually vote against the statement that Muslims are equal citizens. I will leave it at that. Thank you. Stop share. So. so, thank you so much, Annelies, for this really profound, uh, interesting, um, also really engaging and clear presentation 
that takes us uh, back to um, the early 2000, uh, which is also the year where me and you together started to think about, at the time, the issue of the hijab <laughs> as well, um, yeah. after the Affaire de Foulard in France. And and, um, and so, in fact, I while people are gathering uh, their ideas, I would really kind of ask you the question in relation to uh, why do you think uh, the focus on the niqab is um, assuming this really specific connotation? What is different between the banning of the niqab and the banning of the hijab? And how did the banning of the niqab in the Netherlands um, legitimize or, or not uh, the hijab at that point? I'm, I'm, interested, I'm interested to see whether and how the niqab censorship uh, was also aiming at legitimizing certain forms of Islamic sartorial practices as acceptable or tolerable, or whether it was just perceived and the niqab was just perceived and represented as the extreme version of something that is absolutely unacceptable to start with, including any form, of, any any visible expression of Islam in the public sphere. Mm -hmm. And together with this, I think that it. it I mean, one of the most interesting aspects of your talk was that it was clearly showing, uh, and interestingly, I think, um, but cl clearly showing the, 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 the dissonance also between the politicization on the one hand of, of this uh, practice yeah. and the very effective, at least at the beginning, the very effective or pious or ethical nature of, of um of the practice, practice itself for the for the women who who wear the niqab, and then at, at the end, instead, you provide us with a, with an image and with a, with a representation of um, of the niqab becoming an issue of rights and of civil rights. Yeah. So turning away from the affective, pious dimension, um, women are now mobilizing for 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 their own rights, and I I wonder whether you could kind of elaborate a little bit more on that and how, what do you think about um, about that transformation? Yeah. Um, there are lots of questions in the chat, so <clears throat> I guess maybe we can. Um, I don't know what. Uh, can I start with these very complicated questions you you threw at me already? Uh, yeah, okay, but you want uh, me to do that? I mean, uh, I, I thought that maybe we can collect if like, three okay, it's also fine then, yeah, so that we kind of give the floor to the audience and then yeah. you can just address all of them together. Wow, so there yeah. is uh, Miriam uh, in the chat. Um, Miriam, do you want to pose the question or sh should, should I read it? I guess if she put it there, she wants me to read it out. Her comment is, what, what an incredible, fascinating presentation. Thank you. Big question, big affirmation mark. Yes. I know much of your work, but this comparison with real life COVID measures that also involve uh, face coverage really highlights the double standards. We yeah. see it in terms of ethics, our moral obligation to protect each other in one case and our moral sense of solidarity when we want to defend the wearing of her first veil on the other. But the latter is much easier rejected. Uh, what has been your experience among Dutch academic peers regarding this moral paradox? I'd expect that what you say is bro broadly shared at Dutch universities, or is it considered an exception to the liberal rule? So, very interesting and important question. Ah, uh, okay. Laura um, Miares asks, um, also, thank you very much for your interesting talk. I have a concrete question. Could you please explain how the Dutch feminist movement has positioned itself towards the niqab ban? Are there any differences among different feminist movements? Um, and then we have, uh, I'll, I'll say I'll say I read the third one and then I'll let you, I guess, engage. Yes. So Marluz, Marluz Janssen, um, a colleague of mine at the Department of Anthropology mm -hmm. and a, your country fellow. Mm -hmm. uh, asks uh, thank you very uh, thank you thanks a lot Annelies fascinating presentation and great to learn so many new things about my country <laughs> I have to leave so ah sorry <laughs> sorry so this is not a question it's just an <laughs> announcement <laughs> that she had to leave okay, okay. so <laughs> hey, bye -bye. <laughs> I'll let you answer I guess the first four uh, yes okay okay let me start with um, 
so, it's all complicated. Let me start with the very interesting point that you raised, um, Ruba, and that is the point about that in the beginning when I was talking, there was a lot about you know the ethics, the ethical uh, arguments that the women would bring, and that in the later part of the talk, the argument of the point of rights really came up. And I think that is very uh, that is very well um, that's a very good analysis. Um, nonetheless, for the whole period, the arguments that women bring why they wear the niqab are always ethical arguments. You know, they are wearing it because of religious uh, reasons, and these religious reasons may take different forms. That's why I gave you the different kinds of examples, right? But they're all grounded in a sort of notion of, of ethical being. A sort of ethos, a sort of, you know, where they want to go. However, their protest against the niqab, against the niqab ban is very firmly located in a rights discourse. So you have these two discourses that they both draw in for very different reasons. The reason to wear it is very much an ethical discourse. The reason why they speak out, or you know, the, the ways in which they speak out, is very much against double standards, you know, equal citizenship, etc. And that is why I also made a point that you can really see that we have a second generation of young Muslims in the Netherlands who are perfectly well aware of the fact that they have equal rights and that their equal rights are quite systematically undermined by these kinds of these kinds of measures. And a lot of them will not be themselves in favor of wearing a niqab. They wouldn't think about wearing a niqab. That's not the point. The point is that they are against the ban. Yeah. So there, there are, there, these are two different, very different kinds of, you know, depends where you're focusing on. It is also true that in the beginning, there were more women who would have been hesitant about making any rights claims because some of them were very much uh, for, were very much um, very much followed the line that one actually should not become politically active and that political activism is not something that is highly valued in Islam. Okay so there, there's, there is that element but that's definitely not the only element. I think that it's much more you know this whole notion of you know becoming an equal having equal rights as a citizen is very important. So that is how I would read that. So it's not the case that the women who now face fail do so only because they want to make this claim on equal rights. It is true though that a few women actually started wearing it after the ban because they wanted to support their sisters, right? So there is an, a bit of that element there, but by and large, the reasons why women, why women really wear it consistently because it is a hard thing to do, you know? It's not an easy thing to do day after day after day. So it's a hard thing to do. So really, you need to have a very strong religious motivation to do so. Now, it's also true that it is a fluctuating population. So it's not the case that the women who wore it in 2005 will be still wearing it. There are also quite a number of women who have given up wearing it for different reasons. Some because they consider it too dangerous, other ones because they do not consider it anymore having the same religious value as they thought in the past. And so there are different reasons why they give it up also. So then about that issue. Then uh, the question about, uh, let me see. Uh, oh yes, the feminist movement. Well, that is of course a, I think that is true in many countries that uh, the, 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 the feminist movement has, I think we should speak in uh, the plural feminist movements that it depends very much on what kind of feminist movement you're talking about, because we have in the Netherlands definitely a section of the feminist movement which is very much against wearing niqab. And which thinks this is an extremely conservative uh, ideology that is just simply supporting a very conservative, very women-unfriendly ideology. That is another part of the feminist movement is much more open and is much more following the, the line of the equal rights thing, not necessarily arguing that they are for the niqab, but they do reason in terms of, you know, equal citizenship, etc. So they argue against the ban. 
but the first category would actually be often also in favor of the ban because they think this is, you know, because they think it's a really undesirable practice. And they simply will not believe it when a woman says, well, I, I, chose, I, I chose this. And then they will make the argument, yes, well, people chose all sorts of conservative things, but that's not the reason we should support this. So we actually have a section which is a section of um, um, which is in the if you look politically that you would call them social democrats of the labor party that are very critical of the labor party because they are too muslim friendly and they too much talk with imams rather than with you know people who want to leave islam and liberal muslims etc so they feel that they're supporting too much in their interactions the more conservative side of of islam and these people would be also, you would also see uh, quite a lot of, uh, of women involved in that. Both women, both, you know, white Dutch women and women from migrant background. So there is, it's not a clear cut, it's not a clear cut division in terms of identity, but it's much more a division in terms of political projects. You know, what do you think, what do you think politics should be about and what kind of, what, what sort is the kind of politics that you would be willing to support? I think that is would be my answer on the feminist movements in the Netherlands. There's also um, yep. uh, Miriam's question on the... Yeah, yeah, I'm getting there, I'm getting there. We not want to know about, about the colleagues. Oh yeah, the colleagues, yeah, the colleagues. That, that is not a very pleasant question, I think. And it's, a, it's a very good question, because I think that one of the mistakes that we are often making is assuming that um, right-wing um i think it's by now it has become obvious but at least some years ago it was a bit less obvious but that ethno-nationalism is also alive very much amongst our colleagues that we also have academic that this is the, the, the whole idea i think i'm really very uh, very um, hesitant about this whole idea that populism right-wing populism is really something only for you know for the lower uh, the the lower classes in society for quote unquote the poor whites. I think this is this is not at all the case. I think that you also have the same kind of ideas, the same kind of ideas. Who is and who who is actually defining what Dutchness is? That it is also very much something that is alive and kicking amongst the upper middle classes. And let's be let's be serious. Because if you talk about segregation, because one of the big discussions is now about segregation, right? These migrants all segregate in their own areas, in their own circles, etc. What is the most segregated sector of society? Of course, the upper, the upper middle class professionals. They're far more segregated from society than people who live in the poorer neighborhoods. I'm completely convinced that you know the ways in which we look at it is very, very one-sided. And actually, we do have colleagues. I had a highly unpleasant, it's a Dutch colleague, but working at Berlin University, I had a highly unpleasant Twitter exchange with my colleague Ruth Koopmans, for instance, at Berlin University, who called me a reactionary. Uh, like, oh, yeah, what I had done, I had done something very, very is I unforgivable, is that I compared at a certain moment wearing a face veil with wearing high heels. And the reason why I compared it, which he didn't get, was because the question was, you know, somebody made a comment and the person said, well, a niqab is discriminatory for women because only women wear it, men do not wear it. So then I said, well, there are other styles of dress that only are only worn by women, but it does not necessarily mean it's discriminatory. Take, for instance, high heels, and you can actually make an argument that that's worse for your health. So I got this whole sort of, you know, uh, outcry on Twitter that I did actually dare to make this comparison, which was, I think, still is a very interesting comparison. I wrote a piece in Dutch about it. So the argument that this is something that you would not find about your Dutch colleagues is definitely not the case. We also have amongst, we have amongst our, the whole idea that you do not find these kinds of ideas in academia is, I think, very false. Actually, one of the, let me give another example, and then I'll stop about this topic. The other example, the, the person who was until yesterday, the representative of Forum for Democracy, Forum for Democracy is a sort of the intellectual 
counterpart of Wilder's party. So it's very right-wing, Euro, Euroskeptical, conservative, populist, etc. Very anti-immigration, also anti-Muslim. Um, so the person who until yesterday was the representative of this particular political party in the Senate is a professor of law at Leiden University. So, I mean, the whole idea that we at our universities, you know, seem are all these sort of pleasant, uh, pleasant people who do not go for discrimination, et cetera, et cetera, I think is also very much using double standards. Um, what else? There, are, there are lots of other questions in the chat. Uh, Tell me what you want me to answer, uh, Ruba. Yeah, I mean, there are there is also a possibility for anyone who wants to just ask the question by unmuting yourself and raising your hand if you want to talk. I think I would I would now maybe start from the end of the chat. There is a question on um, the meaning of liberal anxieties that is in the title. And if you could expand on what is meant by the selective part of liberal anxieties. OK. OK, this the selective part of the liberal anxieties is that uh, what I use where I use the term liberal and, you know, it's this sort of equal rights to freedom of all for all. Um, and it is in my eyes, it is quite clear that this is not something that is, uh, I mean, I think that it, there, you can very clearly see the bias vis-a-vis -vis the women who were handicapped. So I think the niqab is actually some sort of a, a test case where you can see how far all these so-called liberal ideas in the Netherlands are going because the Netherlands, of course, likes to present itself as this very liberal country, but there are very clear boundaries to what is considered acceptable and what is not considered acceptable. So that is actually why I brought it in. And I brought the anxieties in because of, you know, this sort of centrality of the notion of discomfort. So it is both, it's not simply a legal issue, but it's also a very much an affective issue, which has to do with people's effect, how people feel about certain things. But what I would simultaneously like to highlight then, that you cannot see these two separated from each other. So you can have, you know, the, all these, 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 these uh, implement, these, these legal rules and regulations, but they also have an effective side to them. And they actually produce particular effects. That is what I try to, explain in my talk and I thought it was a nice title. Maybe it would be interesting to know if there was any call for the face mask, the COVID face mask curtailing communication in, in the Netherlands, whether the issue of communication was proposed as a major problem. Well, there is a little bit, there is a bit of that. And actually uh, somebody at my, own, uh, at my own institute is going to do a talk about it, a social psychologist. And she is going to make the argument, I think she is going to make an argument because she has previously done as a social psychologist research about covering the face. And I've been a lot with her in discussion and debate because she does think it, see, it, it hampers, I mean, we both would agree that it hampers communication in some ways, right? But the question is, of course, to what extent does it hamper communication? So I'm not saying that she would be in favor of a ban, of a niqab ban or anything like that, but I think she takes that side of it more seriously than I do. And I think that is because what happens with these social, social psychologists is they do these experiments. And what happens in our kind of research as anthropologists, we engage, we talk to people. So we see people not just simply, we don't simply see that a person, we do a test, an experiment with a person covering part of their face, but we see a person also moving around and speaking. And so you hope, I think the whole fact that covering the face may hamper communication in some ways may also be compensated for by other ways of moving your body, by you raising your voice, using your voice expressively, by more being more expressive with your eyes and with your hands, etc. So, I mean, I'm, I don't know. I mean, it's an open, it's an open question. But what she wants, she argues now, indeed, and that's very interesting, is that this fact that we are wearing these face masks that it's really problematic because we don't smile to each other no more. So we actually should draw a smiley on it and that will make people more happy. I mean, I'm paraphrasing it a bit here. Huh? So um, 
but what she does not take into consideration then and what makes this difficult to actually do this as you know to study this is that at the same time we have the one and a half meter distance so i think actually that's much more important than the face mask the fact that you don't see part of the person's face and that this has an effect for communication is the fact that we have to dis physically distantiate ourselves continuously from others and you cannot separate the two from each other i think yeah. So yes, there are some people who would make an argument that it's more difficult to communicate with face masks. Uh, but I think the main argument that has been made is the argument of freedom. You know, we are no longer free to express ourselves. And it's really a beautiful argument because it's the same argument that Nikabis could make. We are no longer free to, ex to, to be present in the public as we want to. So this is really a very strong limitation of our freedom of expression as expression as you know in terms of dress clear etc and this is of course the very same argument the nikambis could make they could not just go for the argument that it's freedom of religion their freedom of religion is impeded but also their freedom of expression there are lots yeah. lots of questions Annelise, on the chat uh, so i don't even know where to uh... can i ask a question sure yeah because mine is about three. So um, surely can you, when sorry, you pointed you... out the, the, the fact that you know, the face mask is supposedly worn uh, for reasons of health when the highest, the, the highest health authority has said it has no uh, beneficial effect. Mm -hmm. So obviously there is, it is, uh, uh, there's no legality in their, in their usage of this kind of excuse. So why mm -hmm. has there not been a legal challenge made to this ban so that perhaps it could be done via the Council of State. I don't know what the powers of the Council of State are, but you said that they weren't in favour. So if they are, as it were, on board, surely the highest court in Holland could have a case brought to have this absurd and uh, uh, prejudiced uh, uh, piece of legislation um, got rid of. Um, surely that should be proceeded with, that's one question. The other thing with regard to, has there been any actions to, in solidarity, Christian women wearing um, the neck up in combination with perhaps wearing a cross um, to show them up for what they are, just bigoted people, and uh, presumably then they won't get into trouble because they will realise they're Christian, or even men doing so, whether or not there have been good media and good actions taken which would have a lot of publicity and and caused a grave amount of embarrassment to the dutch authorities and the, the last little thing is with regard to if people are made uncomfortable for people by seeing people wearing the neck up what about other people being uncomfortable when a lot of people wear have their noses pierced their their tongues pierced whatever or other people seeing uh, skinheads, which makes them feel, feel really afraid, or, or people wearing uh, revealing clothing, which upsets other people. What about these? These are equally disturbing for some sectors of society. So it doesn't seem to be any, um, yeah, it's not, it's yeah. Not obviously, yeah. Thank you. That was well, and I, I think it's uh, also good because you, you summarize some of the other questions. So, Annelies. Yeah, well, I think uh, the assumption behind it is that there is a particular rational logic here. And I think the problem is that that rationality is in some ways completely lacking. Uh, in, with respect to the Council of State, the Council of State is an advisory body. So it can only give advice. It's a very heavily, it's a very important advice, but they actually the Council of State has already advised against this law. So there's not much more that the Council of State could do in this case. Now, the fact whether people could actually take legal action, it has sort of been preempted by the fact that now it is allowed in public transportation to actually wear a niqab because of the obligation to wear face, uh, to wear face masks. So that wouldn't work anymore. Nonetheless, there is an important thing, and that is that uh, when we have a new law, within three years, the new law needs to be evaluated. So there is now a group of people that is continuously looking at the legal possibilities to actually challenge the law so that within the next 
two years we will be able to get this law of the books again. Um, of course, right, with that uh, regard to that, surely there could be the uh, case brought to the European Court of Human Rights post COVID, so that this this excuse yes. for work for not wearing the uh, for wearing the mask or not wearing the mask is only for the COVID period. So of course that would not pertain to afterwards. So if a case is brought and it takes a very long mm -hmm. time, by the time it's actually heard, it would be in the post COVID area anyway, wouldn't yes. it? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's very that's very true. And people are looking into this, and there is somebody from the law department actually very active in this field. I think the European Court, the, there is a possibility at the human, European Court of Human Rights. The French case was, of course, disastrous, right? Because that was the, the argument there was for living together is more important than uh, the, the arguments that the women had brought. But in the Dutch case, it's a bit different, and the Dutch case is a bit different because it's only a partial ban. And now you may think that a partial ban is less important, so it would stand less chance, but it actually stands more chance because with a partial ban, there are other more proportional, well, proportionate uh, measures that could be taken, and that is the house rules. So there may be an opening there, yes. The point uh, whether uh, men and has taken action. That's actually a very interesting. I wanted to. I was thinking about including it, but I had already a lot of pictures. There's actually a very interesting case of at a gay pride. There's a number of men that don't, did wear a niqab as a strong statement about. Knee, because sometimes this is also done, you know, just to, to make. Uh, oh, oh, they put a burqa on actually, and a very colorful one. And sometimes this is simply done to make fun of women wearing a burqa, but in this case, it was very clearly a political statement against the ban. And they were uh, members of the Social Democrat Party and the party was not amused at all. So they got very heavily censored. But there are, these actions are being taken by people, you know, time and again. They are small scale actions, but they all, you know, you hope that they will get a certain momentum and they will amount something there's uh, um, there, there's yeah. a the, the analyst there are a lot of questions also that tie into this for example iris or iris has do you, do you want to ask it yourself i just ask which parties sorry but which sorry. parties actually voted to lift the ban which of the two parties you mentioned uh to temporarily lift the ban that is denk denk is a political party that is mainly focusing on the rights of migrants or it has a strong you know has a strong uh strong focus on that it's a small political party they have three seats in parliament i think and the green left that was the only other party that voted in favor of temporarily lifting the ban okay uh so iris or iris would you like to ask the question and unmute yourself thank you yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, indeed. Uh, the question, indeed, of the if this ban could be reversed, you actually answered because there will be a review perhaps in two years. Yeah. Um, and I was just very intrigued by also seeing the SGP, which is a Christian party, yeah. uh, being against that uh, statement of like, let's recognize uh, Muslim yeah. uh, people as citizens. Okay. Um, what is there like some religious argument involved as yes. well and how does that play into that you know freedom of religion and secular state and everything yeah well, the freedom of religion is not of course not freedom of religion for everybody and the sgp is actually an extremely conservative and an extremely uh islamophobe party so they are very explicitly for the rights for christians they're actually with great effort the SGP has been uh, pushed to allow women to become full members of the party. They were very much, they don't have any women in parliament. They, for until very recently, they would not allow women to be voted in any political position because they think, you know, that the man is the person who is supposed to represent women in politics and women should not be doing that themselves. One could imagine, of course, the uproar this would cause, right, if a Muslim would say that. So we usually have these comparisons and we use the political party statements from the SGP, from this particular Christian party. And if you put Islam or Muslim there, you immediately see 
you know, what would happen if you, you know, if there, if any Muslim party would do that, they would be completely marginalized and outside. But the SGP, you know, they're our own, you know, they're our own people, they're right, right? They're our own people. So they very much emphasize that the Dutch nation is built on Christianity and not on Islam. So that is the reason why. So they are, first of all, they're not so much for, you know, equal representation whatsoever, also not for men and women. But then they have a very strong pro-Christian agenda and Christian in the sense of, you know, in a very conservative, very in a, in, a, in a quite a reactionary way, I think. Uh, Alice, I, I wanted to ask you a question quickly because there are also lo lots of other questions, but I, I think that um, um, it's something that I, I um, resonates with some of the other comments. I was wondering whether you think that um, precisely the fact that the, the, the Muslim women wearing, wearing the niqab are Dutch, they are not like newly arrived immigrants who are allowed mm -hmm. some extent yeah. of exoticism or different... Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually uh, makes it m more intolerable for the liberals that it is within actually yeah. all society. Absolutely. So it's not... I think absolutely. Issue. Yeah. I think that is absolutely true because the first idea was... For, and and ta it, again, it comes up eh, because I think that's what people like to think sometimes. Again, in parliament, it comes up, you know, these new immigrants need to adapt to Dutch culture. Well... If you are talking about converts, and if you're talking to Moroccan Dutch people who have been born and raised in this country, they are Dutch. They are part of Dutch culture. So it becomes a very, uh, it becomes then very painful for people who find this an affront to our culture, you know, to actually have to include these people in the nation. So it's much more problematic. Like if you would have recent immigrants, etc., they are vulnerable. Right, you can uplift them. You can, you know, put a whole paternalist machinery. You can put out there, as it were. Maybe I sound a little cynical, but I do. I do think it's true. But when you have people who are self-confident and who have been raised in this country and who make choices that, for some people, are that, that to some people are completely incomprehensible, then it becomes much more problematic. And that is also why I ended with the whole idea, you know, that it is this, this self-confident generation that really is one of the reasons why there is such a strong backlash. Yeah, thank you, Anils. Simran, do you want to ask your question? Simran. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you so much for the presentation. It was extremely insightful in bringing out these structural relations uh, and also the differences within the feminist movement, as you've been talking about. Uh, my query was actually to do with street level bureaucracy. I understand that the ban itself came in a year ago, but as such, and maybe it's to do with the COVID lockdowns and such, but uh, there has, I think you mentioned only about four cases that came up under the law. Four warnings, yeah. Four, four warnings. warnings, exactly. And I wondered that it appeared as if the law and uh, given the fact that there's been enough resistance to it for good reason and there's even been uh, strategic efforts that the movements have come up with in finding uh, supports buddies and you know mm -hmm. um, ways of bringing in uh, uh, it symbolically um, so I, I wondered whether the street level bureaucracy in fact had a way to resonate with the movement itself. Was that something that, uh, you know, if you could shed some light on and what is their discourse? Um, I, you were referring to people like, you know, the bus drivers, the security guards, etc., right? And to policemen. I'm referring to the policemen, basically. Yeah. The yeah, state, yeah, okay. how is the state actually, uh, because if they're just four instances, I know you say that there are only five, hundred women, less than 500 women who wear it, but they're also strategic efforts against it. So that would have increased the number. Yeah, the police is completely uninterested in this. They, they think it's a huge hassle. They don't want to be called out, you know, for the fact that there is a woman wearing a face veil at an health center with a child, and then they have to forcibly remove her or fine her. 
I mean, that's not the idea what, you know, although there is, of course, also, I mean, I, I should not be too op completely optimistic because you also find amongst these people also supporters from builders, right? So, I mean, it's not, you cannot make a general statement, but generally speaking, professionally speaking, it does run sort of against the sort of the hierarchy in what are important tasks and what are less important tasks. And you have to just, I mean, it's so, if you think about how many women are murdered every year, if you think about the huge numbers of uh, child abuse, if you think about the huge numbers of um, women who are beaten up, beaten up in family situations, etc., these issues are obviously so much more important than a person, you know, putting a putting on a face cover, that it's completely out of proportion. So I always say also, you know, if you really want to do something, if you're really interested in doing something against women's oppression, it's a bit odd to focus on this 100 to 500 women. Shouldn't you focus on a category that is much more facing much more problems? And I think this is also something that resonates with, you know, the police officers, because from the, well, the mayor of Amsterdam actually said in the beginning, I'm not going to do this law. And of course, she got a lot of criticism because you can't just sim simply say, I'm not going to do this law, right? I mean, that is going a bit far. I can understand that. But then she changed and said, well, it does not have a high priority for our police force, which is, of course, completely understandable if you look at the more regular problems that the police force is, is confronted with. So it's also very easy to have you know, so it's both from the top, I think, of the police organization that really does not find this an interest and, and find this a high priority topic. And it's also from the regular policemen on the ground. Some of them, you know, you always find these, these particular characters who are very unpleasant. We've all been confronted with them probably in our lives one moment or another, who are simply unpleasant characters. So you may meet one of those people, but on, right. in, on the average, you know, this is not something that people really, you know, the, 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 why people would join the police force. Right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Anis. I, I think uh, maybe one last question and then we we should uh, thank Annelies uh, for the wonderful talk. Um, there, anyone wants to, anyone who has written the question down in the chat wants to take uh, the floor and it's so much nicer speaking about communication for your voice to, <laughs> to express it. Uh, Janine? Is, is she still there? Some people Where's have Janine. So if she's not there, maybe we, we won't ask a question. No, oh, she's there. Janine, do you want to ask? Yes, I'm here. I'm sorry. <laughs> you caught me. Because we know you, can, you like in, uh, like in a, like in a classroom. Have comfortable somewhere during this talk. <laughs> <laughs> Many thank analysts. This was really an extremely interesting talk, and I was particularly thank interested you. because we will. Be, I'm located in Switzerland, and we will be voting on a burka ban actually in I think two months or something. Huh? So okay. all the, we have all these discussions now going on. And I had two questions, but on the first one, you already answered because this question about, well, these are Dutch women. So I think this makes really a difference when it comes to all these debates. And the second one is like kind of what happened after this, this law? I mean, have there been much more women putting on a face whale as a, in terms of a reaction as a feeling like stigmatized and discrimination, etc., or didn't it matter at all, basically? Because I always think that this kind of symbolic politics, it also triggers reactions, obviously. And yeah. one of the yeah, reactions yeah, yeah, yeah. would be yeah. that, uh, well, you do these things, you know? So yeah. what happened in this regard? Yeah, no, no, this also happened. It actually did happen because uh, one of the women who is actually very active, she uh, started wearing, she was thinking already about wearing a niqab, but she wasn't quite convinced yet, but this was for her the last moment, this was for the moment to actually go and do it. Okay. So it does, that does happen. One always, it always remains to be seen how long people will do it. You know, so it depends whether, you know, they, they really, it becomes more of a religious, it, it gets more of a religious meaning to them also. Mm -hmm. how, I mean, it depends how the religious meaning develops further in their lives. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's hard to say actually how this, what, what, will, how, what will happen in the future. 
but there are cases, there definitely are cases, but there are also women who have given up wearing the face veil in the course of the last years because they consider it too dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's both, but I, yeah. I, I always say, well, it's not a very, you know, I would not call it a victory for the government when people no longer wear a face veil because they feel that it's too dangerous to do so. I think that is, you know, not the kind of politics that we would like to support. Of course, yes. Thank you. And obviously, once this problem is over, there will, I mean, there will always be a Wilders inventing another one. So. Oh yeah, there will definitely be something else. Yes. So uh, I think there is there is there is a last comment, I guess, which is uh, interesting because it's a proposal for a research project from Christine. <laughs> yes. Uh, Christine, do you want to just put 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 it uh, as a last comment um, to Annelies, or do you want me to read it? Uh, here, here, she, here she is. Yeah, I'm here. Thank you so yeah, much. Christine. Okay, hi, Christine. Hi, this is great. No, I was just thinking, I mean, you already started thinking here about ways in which a comparison between the ban on face covering and the, the, the injunction to wear medical masks may be a very productive way of studying secular and, and liberal anxieties. Um, and and um, maybe also different ethics of the self. So you already touched on, on these different dimensions. Do you think that this could really be developed into a, a full-fledged anthropological comparative project? And, and will you do that? And how, what would it look like? Oh, I don't know what it would do. I was just starting to think about it because I do think it's very interesting because it also, and, and I didn't completely answer the question about the liberal anxiety, of course, because there's also this, this strong anxiety now in the country amongst the certain, certain groups in the population who are really very concerned about this obligation to wear face masks. So it's a really, it's, 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 a, it's, an, it's an very much a situation that is in flux at the moment, and I'm just trying to follow it. And see how this develops but I do think it's it's important because I do think it's very if you want to make any kind of comparison that you also that need to take into consideration how people actually view the fact that you actually wear a face mask whether you see this as a positive or a negative thing I think that would no doubt have some kind of effect I mean I would think my hypothesis would be that that would have some kind of an effect and I would be interested in looking into that because this topic will never leave me yeah how can we help people out there? Can we be emailing members of the government? How can we actually change the situation, do something meaningful? Any suggestions? Um, at this moment, well, I think that we, what we are doing at the moment is uh, in the Netherlands is just simply keeping this topic on the table, keeping, you know, keeping writing, uh, writing pieces in the Dutch papers, et cetera, about how hypocritical, because that is, of course, the term that comes up, right? This is so hypocritical, especially when you see that poster, you know, please put on a face mask, but you're prohibited from wearing a kneecap. I mean, come on, get real, you would think. But anyway, this again may change, of course, because in December, one December, the, the, the law will change again. And the, the law will be that you need to wear face face coverings, face masks, in all enclosed spaces, not outside, but in enclosed spaces. So that will then probably mean that they will follow the same thing as public transportation, that they would allow people then to wear any cap. Yeah. So you're hopeful. Huh? Do you have some hope? <laughs> yeah. Well, we will see what happens, actually. So, and there are already, as I said, there are people looking into the legal side, you know, in, in which way we can take this to a European level or can have any kind of influence on this. Annelies, thank you so very much for this. Really, um, we, we failed to read out uh, the many compliments for your talk from the chat. Um, everyone was really uh, thankful and um, really engaged by by the presentation and 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 of course if anyone wants to mo know more about Annelies research she has a website and you can go and read her articles and books and know more about this I would just like to end um, the seminar today by obviously again thanking Annelies and maybe giving the floor to Kim to announce next our next um, seminar next week and the procedures <laughs> there will be some small changes in the way that we 
uh, handle the technical is part of the seminar. You're muted. You're muted. Kim. Yeah, again, thank you, Annalise. It was so interesting. I think, you know, I'm going to go away from this and do a lot of different reading on different areas. And um, um, I think there's just so much uh, that we could discuss here. Um, we thank do you for your uh, support have... also. Thank you. And then we do have another session coming up next week. Um, so uh, it is nearly the same time. So it'll be five till 6.30. Uh, though obviously we, we do tend to overrun on some of these events, so um, we'll see. I have put the Eventbrite link into the chat, um, so you will see it there, and it's uh, White Privilege and Shortcuts to Anti-Racism. Um, what we're going to do with the event is you'll still sign up through the Eventbrite, um, but what I'm going to do is add everybody to the Zoom um, to the Zoom call, so you shouldn't have to put in a password coming into the call. Um, so, and I will be sending out an email um, at three o'clock next week to let you know that that's all been done and give you um, any kind of extra instructions that you might need for the event. Uh, so please do feel free to sign up to that um, link that I've put in there for you. Um, and again, each week we will have subsequent links that come on. Um, and these can also be found um, on the main SOAS website um, and also on our Facebook page for SOAS as well. So please do come along to the events. Um, there's uh, you know, so many different discussions that we're having as part of them. Um, in terms of the recording of this event, um, I'm just gonna go through it with Annalise just for the pictures that were included in um, some of the slides, uh, but we will have a, um, a version of this for you to listen back to again afterwards. Um, and I will be emailing that out to you um, all with the appropriate passwords to access that as well. Thank you so much, Kim. Thanks, everyone. And uh, see you all next week. Um, thanks, Annelies, so much. Everyone is uh, dropping really enthusiastic. <laughs> That's embarrassing. <laughs> uh, see you next week for uh, uh, yes. the wonderful Miriam Ura talk on shortcuts to um, uh, white, um, uh, uh, white privilege and um, anti, sorry, white privilege and shortcuts to anti-racism. Uh, and uh, yeah, have a good night, everyone. Thank you again, Annelies. Together with the uh, recording, you will also receive, I think, the comments in the chat. So no. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Oh, interesting to see. Okay. Thank bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. -bye. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you, everybody. Bye. Oh. Yeah.